So, I'm going to talk today about Peterson's defense of hierarchy. I want to start by acknowledging that it's often difficult to take this seriously to critique it, or certainly it is for me. I am going to come down on the side of, of saying that this is something that the left should take seriously. It is worth critiquing, but I want to kind of start by acknowledging some of the reasons that uh, it can be really tempting to just dismiss this as just total abject nonsense and roll your eyes. Um, especially, I think, given my own biases, since I teach for a lot of philosophy for a living, all of my training is in taking apart arguments and putting them back together again, and Peterson is just going to, as was kind of indicated at the end of the last presentation here, Peterson's just going to give you nothing in that regard. He's not in the argument business. That's not what he does. And also, I think myself as a Marxist, uh, Derek Varn was here, he could explain that I'm actually just a Catskate revisionist, but uh, <laughs> I'm under the delusion that I'm a Marxist. And Peterson says a lot of really weird stuff about Marxism. So he's always talking about postmodern Marxists who are you know, overrunning the universities and you know, run all the academic departments, which is weird in several ways, one of which is that if you know, you're actually uh, a socialist with a university job, you don't really feel like you have as much company as all that. And uh, also that postmodernism and Marxism are very different things. It's not necessarily completely impossible to combine elements of these, but there's certainly some considerable tension between these two ideas. Postmodernism is all about rejecting grand narratives about the structure of human history, and Marxism is exactly the kind of grand narrative that postmodernism rose up to reject. And if you really press Peterson on this point, like, uh, for example, some people did in the Reddit AMA he did a little while back, uh, he'll just sort of say, well, it's, it's not my fault that these people are incoherent. <laughs> Which just kind of assumes that this large number of people with this view exist and doesn't really explain what he even means by it. Uh, a slightly better response, but only slightly, you sometimes get from his fans, like if you had anybody watch the video that um, Contra points did with Roman Millennial, uh, Roman Millennial's defense was that, well, uh, it's not exactly that these postmodern SJW types, again, equating those is also wrong, but let's not even get into that. Uh, it's not exactly that they're Marxists, but they think that black people are oppressed by white people and women are oppressed by men, and, and that's basically like the way that Marxists think that workers are oppressed by capitalists. <laughs> uh, so in that sense, these are at least like neo-Marxists. And that's a really weird claim too, because if the idea that one group is oppressing another group and that's bad in some way is Marxist, then Marxism predated Karl Marx by pretty much all of human history. <laughs> uh, all the French revolutionaries were Marxists, uh, you know, Spartacus was a Marxist, you know, he clearly thought that Roman slaves were oppressed, you know, by their masters, uh, the authors of the Book of Exodus were Marxists. So that just seems like a really weird, unhelpful way to talk. He also talks a lot about quality of outcome. Uh, in the video where he claimed a couple weeks after dodging the debate that he had scheduled with Doug that uh, Marxists never wanted to debate him. He even used this phrase, quality of outcome Marxists. You know, I, I can't get a quality of outcome Marxist to debate him. He's constantly talking about how Marxists or postmodern Marxists or postmodern neo-Marxists believe in a quality of outcome. So the contrast here is supposed to be to equality of opportunity, and Peterson's story, and he's sticking to it, is that equality of opportunity pretty much exists, at least in modern, advanced Western societies, uh, and so the inequalities that we get in those societies are a result of natural hierarchies of competence. All right, now among the many, many, many things wrong with this, Besides the fact that really trying to separate quality of outcome from quality of opportunity is just incoherent. Uh, one generation's outcomes are the next generation's opportunities. That should be pretty obvious if you think about it for a couple seconds. Uh, and beyond all of the tremendous 
evidence that he's ignoring from the social sciences about the actual state of quality of opportunity between different groups. Just as a claim about the history of ideas, this is a bizarre thing to do. Again, this idea that Marxists are all about this you know, quixotic quest for a quality of outcome is just a bizarre misreading of Marx and Engels and the Marxist tradition. Uh, for one thing, this idea of justice as a quality, that you sort of have this platonic idea of justice, that what justice would be is a perfectly equal distribution, and then you're going to try to change the world until it approximates your ideal, is about the furthest thing in the world from the way that Marx and Engels saw politics. For one thing, to the extent that they trafficked in explicitly normative concepts at all, you know, concepts about what should be, uh, it generally wasn't justice. When Marx talks about justice, he's generally somewhat dismissive of the way people talk about that. It's freedom, like freedom from domination uh, by, for example, workers uh, dominated by capitalists. And just on a more fundamental level than that, this is just the opposite of how Marx sees politics. Marx sees politics in this way where you start with a material analysis of the world, you see what the internal tension points and you know, contradictions in that sense are in the world, and then you see what possibilities are opened up by those points of tension. And sure, you root, you know, it's not it's not rooting for some of the possibilities, you know, what's the, what's the working class to win, but that's a very different thing from thinking in terms of, okay, I have this abstract ideal of justice, which would be perfect equality, and I'm gonna to try to impose that on the world. That's, that's just a fundamental misunderstanding. Also, you can say, okay, in defense of Peterson here, you can say that uh, Marx, even though he doesn't use the language of justice, is sometimes at least implicitly talking about what would count as a just distribution, uh, what in the sort of 20th century, you know, analytic political philosophy tradition, what we might be called a theory of distributive justice, most obviously in critique of the Gotha program. Marx is talking about different ways that things could be distributed, uh, in a post-revolutionary society. But in there, he's explicitly not endorsing a, a totally egalitarian idea. Uh, in Critique of the Gotham Program, I don't want to spend too long on this because I want to keep this moving and you know, leave time at the end for Q&A, but I'd love to get into this there. It seems to me that Marx pretty explicitly endorses what John Rawls in the 20th century calls the difference principle, which is the principle that if certain you know, inequalities in distribution, for example, like incentives for certain kinds of productivity, ultimately benefit the people who are at the bottom of society, then that's okay. Right? And even in the long term, when Marx foresees a future where um, cultural changes from capitalism and technological abundance have gotten to the point where everybody can just kind of take what they need, that's still very different from enforcing an exactly equal distribution. And then there are the lobsters. Um, Peter Sim often seems to suggest that the fact that even lobsters have hierarchies means that it's um, this sort of utopian madness for humans to try to get rid of our eternal social hierarchies, which if you, if you read what he's doing there as something like an argument that, oh, because of this stuff about lobsters, uh, it would just be madness and only lead to gulags, you know, for humans to, to try and get rid of our hierarchies and achieve equality. Then it seems like a really weird argument, because why would that, you know, why would that fall? Like, that's why, you know, what's, what is it about lobsters uh, such that if they're this way, then, you know, then humans are, are inevitably this way. Or ants, in some cases. Um, here's a memorable to Peterson tweet about ants. Um, it this is wrong. says 30% of the ants do 70% of the work, not a consequence of the West or capitalism, in case it needs to be said. Now, fun thing about this is if you click through to the study, it's wrong about most of this. Um, in fact, when it talks about a lot of ants not working a lot of times, that's because there's like this complex cooperative system of working in shifts for the good of the whole group. Uh, so it's almost the opposite of what Peterson's taken from it. But again, all of this makes it really hard to take this seriously 
And if you just kind of see Peterson as this eccentric who, you know, has this weird jumble of views and for culturally contingent reasons he happens to be getting a lot of attention right now, then it might not be clear, you know, how much effort the left should sort of devote to you know, doing things like this conference. All right, so I want to try to, and you know, when I was originally doing this, the temptation to make fun of Peterson a lot more than I'm doing right now was almost overwhelming. <laughs> uh, I found a passage in Maps of Meaning uh, where he's talking about a dream he had about his beautiful cousin, which is the funniest thing that I've ever read. Oh, could you send that to me? That yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll do a dramatic reading. That meeting. will be helpful for my work. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but with great fortitude, I left it out. Um, so, because I want to focus on the core of what I think Peterson's project is. And once we kind of get what the core of the project is and how it all fits together, we can at least see how to relate to him, I think, as an ideological enemy. And how to make sense of some of the claims that he makes that we talked about in the first slide. When I say making sense of them, I don't mean in any way that's going to make them plausible, but in a way that will help us understand how they all fit together and how, in a weird way, he might have kind of stumbled sideways into something that's sort of true. So, I think to think about what Peterson's role is, to think about what, um, what he's ultimately doing politically, uh, it's helpful to sort of think, okay, what would the left-wing analog of Peterson be? Right? What's, the, you know, what's the sort of socialist mirror image of Peterson here. And what I want to suggest is that if you think about like Marx, the mode of Marx that would be equivalent to what Peterson is doing here isn't the Marx who's writing detailed, um, complicated, rigorous economic analysis and capital, certainly, or even the Marx of the Communist Manifesto, but maybe the Marx of the uh, contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, which if you've never heard of that, that's fine. Uh, but he, even if you've never heard of it, you probably know the most famous quote from it, because that's the one where Marx talks about how religion is the opium of the people. So later on, a little bit after he says that religion is the opium of the people, Marx says that the abolition of religion is the illusory happiness of the people, is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore an embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears to which religion is the halo. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers off the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but that he can throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. Okay, so let's think for a minute about what Marx is doing here and how he's suggesting the criticism of religion ties into a larger emancipatory project, and then kind of go back to Peterson and see how he relates to that. But I also want to suggest here that even if you're not down with all of Marx's premises, if, for example, uh, you're not an atheist or an agnostic, you know, maybe, you know, maybe some people here are Christian socialists, that you can still get this, this sort of spirit of what Marx is doing here. And the way I think you can, can think about it is this, that every society that is, has the sort of hierarchies that uh, Peterson likes has some sort of mythological bullshit to, to justify those hierarchies. The divine right of kings is an obvious example of that. And the idea that the structural inequalities of capitalism are just natural hierarchies of competence is another one. And so whatever you think about religion as a whole, you know, you can see what Marx is doing here is saying that kind of tearing down these stories that society tells to justify the way things are, the way things are structured, is this kind of necessary part of what later becomes a political project 
of emancipation. And if you think about it that way, then want to suggest that in a weird sense, Peterson isn't totally wrong when he groups together Marxism, postmodernism, and all these other things, not because those aren't very different things, but because if you think of Marx as like the great demystifier, the guy who is by giving you a comprehensive materialist theory of how capitalism comes about, how it works, and how it might be overcome, is acting in the simplistic but maybe helpful metaphor here about a guy about Toto, you know, like somebody who's tearing down off the curtains, you know, you can see the man behind the curtain. You, know, you can see the economic interest behind the bullshit the capitalist society tells about itself. And if that's the way that you think about Marx's project, or at least the Marx who's writing the Opium of the People passage, you know, the Marx who's criticizing religion as a sort of prelude to criticizing capitalism, you can think of what Peterson is doing as a remystification project. So this gets down to a question, you know, I've chatted with a few people about over the weekend and you know, I've been thinking about before this, which is that you know, sometimes leftists, I think in their overexcitement about the many things that are wrong with the guy, uh, will say that, oh, Jordan Peterson is a fascist, or you know, he's alt-right, or something like that. And I think that's wrong. I think it's important they're wrong. But it's not a coincidence that fascists love Jordan Peterson. And that's not, I'm not saying that to tar him with, you know, association or anything like that, but to try to think about what his role is as a reactionary, what kind of reactionary he is. And I think the kind of reactionary that Peterson is, is sort of analytically upstream from the differences between different kinds of reactionaries in practice, between you know, fascist alt-right types and uh, libertarians who, you know, dream of, you know, an anarcho-capitalist utopia or, you know, Reagan Republicans for that matter. That those sorts of fine-grained political differences aren't really relevant to Peterson's project. What he is is he's an elemental reactionary. What I mean when I say that he's an elemental reactionary is that he's trying to push on this kind of mythical, primordial level this reactionary worldview from which, once you buy into that, then you can kind of work out the details of how to apply it to a political program. And this is how everything fits together. Um, and if you think of the lobsters and the ants, not so much as an argument that Peterson is making, that you know lobsters and ants supposedly have these hierarchical setups, therefore capitalism is best, you know, you know how does that work? Uh, but you think of this as almost like fables, you know, it's like, it's like Aesop, you know, that you're using animal stories, you know, to try to make a point about humans. I think you're much closer to the mark, that he thinks that this is just so basic to our nature that any attempt to mess with it is just going to lead to disaster. And this also ties in everything from the self-help advice that since we're just stuck with hierarchies, trying to get rid of hierarchy is just going to lead to disaster and gulags and madness and cats and dogs living together. So instead of trying to tear down social hierarchies, all you can do for you know young men who aren't prospering in those hierarchies, uh, you know, forget about the young women, but you know, young men, is that you can you know tell them to stand up straight and clean their room and you know do the things that might help them advance through the hierarchy. Uh, it, it's what ties in all of the sort of quasi Jung, quasi Joseph Campbell, you know, mythic story stuff, because on a really, really basic level, Peterson's claim is that there's this mythic script to human existence that we diverge from at our peril, that we, that like, it's just not a good idea to try to mess with. So he'll say things like, oh, we left us complain about unjust social structures. Uh, they, you know, they're tying in, you know, they're tapping into one archetype, which is the unjust tyrant, but then there's this other archetype, the wise king, and they're ignoring that, and so it's incomplete. This is almost a verbatim quote from Peterson. And of course, you know, the socialist republic 
isn't one of those mythic, you know, mythic archetypes, uh, but that's kind of the point. You know, you, you know, don't diverge from the script. This is, you know, this is what we've got, and any attempt to mess with this is just going to lead to disaster. And I think it's really telling if you look at what a lot of people seem to get out of it. So this is a quote that I've always loved from uh, several months ago. There was a profile of Peter said in the New York Times, I think in the Sunday Magazine. And they quote this guy, Andrew McVicker, 45, a waiter, says, it was good to hear someone finally talk about how hier hierarchies were okay. He said, current politics are pushing for everyone to be the same, promoting women and minorities into unearned positions. So, I think I've already talked for about 15 minutes at least. Um, so I, I do want to try to leave a few minutes for Q&A here. So this is the thought that I want to end on. In terms of thinking about how to push back against Peterson, that having identified his project as something that's of interest to people who do want to tear down hierarchies and pursue some sort of emancipatory project. And if you want to critique it, well, I think there are a few different ways of doing that. The one that, as I've indicated, my professional training is all about, sadly, isn't going to be very relevant because Peterson is not in the argument business, so there's no point trying to critique his arguments. Um, if you, you know, have a snarky podcast, just make fun of him, that's good. You know, nothing wrong with that. It's dominance hierarchy. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you better and I am. <laughs> another, but to the extent that you can reach out to Peterson fans, I think one way to do that is just by asking them questions like this one. Like, think about Andrew McVicker from the New York Times profile. To review, Andrew McVicker, 45, a waiter. Right. So, here's the question that I think we should be asking the Andrew McVickers of the world, and we'll end on this thought. How's that economic hierarchy working out for you? <laughs> yeah. This, this is a little bit off track, but what I'm confused by, and as you say, he's not argumentation and coherence is in his thing, but when you, there's a really interesting contradiction in his work, and I wonder if yeah. maybe there's a way of picking out fans in either of these two directions, although it might not necessarily help us sure. with a left perspective, but it seems to me that like on one hand, if you're obsessed with a certain type of social cohesion as represented by like monogamy mm -hmm. and traditional family arrangements and stuff like that, there is a kind of more of this in the UK basically, but there are these like Catholic conservatives oh, who, yeah. unlike people in the United States, are actually willing to say like markets need to be regulated because we actually recognize that unlimited capital flow and deregulation is going to necessarily, like, and this is a tense thing for us on the left, right? Because sure. some of these social advances that are correct and a benefit of capitalism, but let's be real, like, they're not happening because people are protesting, yeah. they're happening like, because, like, the market demands that more people be in the workforce, that there more be, you know, liquid movement and capital and services and people. Yeah. So that's, and then that's why on the flip side, someone like, you know, Zygmunt Bauman, who's a really good old school Marxist, yeah. can write some critiques of this stuff that conservatives can nod at, like, yeah, he's right, there's sure. no community, there's no, so, okay, so there's one part that he's appealing to with that stuff, and then it's like, if he had an actual project, then he would be a sort of right-wing critic of capitalism. But then he does, he's like, okay, well, Everything's disrupted, we're not coherent, we're not in community anymore, and we're not traditional, so what you need to do is show up, to, like, I'll be snarky for a second. Yeah. We did a whole segment once on how, like, you know, it's like, well, you know, if you look at the DNA helix, it's really like, you know, it's, it's Young talked about this, and, and then, which is why you should, you should show up five minutes early for work. <laughs> like, everything is actually just like, here's how you compete better. Yeah. In a system which actually will never, ever, ever lend itself or uh, support the maintenance of structure he wants. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Uh, I think that it would, like, yeah, I mean, so clearly there, there is this tension uh, within conservatism that uh, capitalism is the great destroyer of tradition. I mean, the first few pages of the Communist Manifesto are sort of basically prose poetry about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, and some Marx is celebrated it to a point, although, you know, not But it's also really super brutal. Like, yeah. So, like, some of it really isn't good. Yeah. Like, quite people a bit. actually should be able to do yeah, quite a bit is work. Not good. And, yeah, quite community and shit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it really comes out, like, in after. Um, after the uh, 2016 election, a lot of uh, sort of never Trump conservative types at the National Review uh, decided that to start, you know, like in their disgust about what had just happened, a lot of these people reconciled themselves more or less to Trump later, but in their disgust about what had happened, they started talking about white working class people in the industrialized areas more or less the way the National Review has always talked about black people. You know? Oh yeah, yeah that, that was their pivot. Again, that's, they're trash too. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 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 That's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it got to a point where I, I, I yeah. pretty much thought the National Review was going to start doing you know, some ph phrenology charts to you know, <laughs> show that you know, people on the coast weren't descended from the same you know, <laughs> ancestors as you know, people, uh, people in Michigan. Uh, but, and in some of these articles where they were like, waxing brutalistic about, you know, how these, these people who, you know, are just stupid and it's their own fault, they're poor and all that stuff, they started talking about how, you know, like, there were some of these writers in the National Review who started talking about, well, why don't they just, you know, it's ridiculous, they, they have nobody to blame for themselves, it's just cultural poverty, they should just pick up and, like, just move across the country, just find where the jobs are and move there, and... That's something really, really weird about the idea that conservatives going to advocate that, that you know, yeah. everybody should just pick up like the families and the grapes of wrath and you know, just, just mass migrate across the country, you know, that we should that there should be just this constant nomadic search for where the jobs are, because if you care about things like families and rooted communities, you know, that that, that might like revolve around neighborhood churches and the kinds of things you would expect conservatives to like. Right. right? You really can't get that. And I think that is a real tension point in Peterson specifically, uh, because I don't think that he could he could really make that that pivot to sort of the um, the crunchy conservative critique of capitalism. Because if he did, then he'd have to kind of stop celebrating the Joseph Campbell mythic quest up through the ranks of the economic hierarchy right, right. in the way that uh, it, which is kind of the whole point. Right. So happy. Yeah. No. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Strategically, I mean, I uh, I think Brooks and I have different answers on this actually. But um, how do you play off of that tension without flat platforming concern? And I say this as a person who does it because I'll I'll talk on Peter Hitchens exactly on that point. Like that there's these these Catholic reactionaries, and if you if you fight Peterson with their arguments, it's actually easier to hit him than with ours. Sure. Um, but, at what point, I mean, like, how, where do you, how do you use that strategically, is what I'm asking. Like, how can you actually play that out? Because we're not those guys either. We don't actually think that, like, sure, we can even, we don't even think it's possible that you could go back to, like, national, like normal, traditional family norms of the 19th century invented traditions. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, Mike wants to respond to that also, because uh, I'd be curious about his thoughts, but I I guess I would say that if the goal isn't to make Jordan Peterson fans, uh, Chris and Peter Hitchens fans, right, like that's, that's, that's not, um, you know, it's not totally clear to me that that's, you know, that's, uh, that's got a, a move that's forward, or at least very much forward. Um, then I'd say that there's there's a there's a way to do it where uh, you you take part of that argument, right? So, which is kind of pointing out that there's this big contradiction at the heart of a lot of this stuff. But just because there's a contradiction at the heart of something, that doesn't by itself tell you anything about where you go to resolve it. That if you um, See, now I can do my logic schmuck thing. So, uh, in, uh, if you 
if you have, you know, reductio ad absurdum <laughs> arguments, uh, say it's Latin even, you know, that's how logic schmucky this is going to get. Uh, you know, reduction to absurdity, that's what you call it when you, you know, when you show that somebody's position leads to an inconsistency, that, that just tells you them that they've got something wrong somewhere. Right? It doesn't tell them what they've got wrong. Mm. So actually rethinking all of your original premises to see where you went wrong is the right response to it, rather than just like immediately assuming it's whatever your interlocutor thinks it is. And so I think that maybe at least, you know, with some of these guys, I mean, I, I don't want to exaggerate how many of them are winnable, but, uh, but maybe at least with some of them, pointing out that contradiction could start a process that could get them thinking about, okay, how do we want to resolve this, right? You know, do we, uh, if you don't like the idea that we should all be neoliberal nomads, and you might not, even though, you know, even though you, you like um, the idea of, you know, gender hierarchy, maybe that seems to be, you know, one of Peterson's big points of appeal, would even you, Jordan Peterson fan, really, really want to go back to, you know, as you say, the 19th century or even the 1950s, you know, like really think about what that would entail, right? Is that something you really want? And at that point, we can pitch our solution to the inconsistency, which is, hey, how about having a society where people are economically enabled to make all sorts of life choices as they choose? Wouldn't that be nice? And I hate to cut us off, but we do have to get going on the next session. And again, there'll be plenty of time to have more conversations after the fact. So thank you.